sadness, difficulty concentrating, loss of interest, depression can be treated. The first step is talking. Welcome to Healthy Cleveland. I'm your host, Leah Haslidge, and today we're talking summer activity preparedness. With us is Shadi Swade, who is the project director for the Cleveland Department of Public Health's Office of Emergency Preparedness. And we have Jordan Bryan from the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center as our ASL interpreter. Welcome. Thank you for having me. So with summer activities, obviously being outside, we're going to possibly get burnt, so we need to apply some sunscreen. Well, hopefully we the won't first get burnt. Step. Hopefully yeah. we won't get burnt, but Absolutely. talk to us about sunscreen, and, and is it actually important to it wear? It is important, and a lot of people don't know the difference between sunscreen and sunblock. Oh, um, there is a difference. There is a difference. People don't, I, people don't know. know. Um, and so those two things protect against different types of radiation. Sunscreen protects against um, the kind of radiation that causes aging and wrinkling, whereas sunblock protects against what causes burning and melanoma. And so you really want to choose a product that contains both of those things. Is that the that. UVA and UVB? Yes, absolutely. So, um, and also you want to look at when you're choosing a sunscreen, um, what is the SPF or the sun protection factor? Um, the higher the number, the better the protection is going to be. Um, you definitely want to choose something with at least an SPF of 15, uh, but preferably even higher, you know, anywhere between 30 and 50 is, is great. Um, and you always want to apply that sunscreen at least 30 minutes before you head outside and then reapply it every two hours because we're in the sun, it kind of melts away and we sweat. And so you always want to make sure you're reapplying it. If you have a buddy to help you make sure you're not <laughs> missing any spots, anything like that. Um, even people who um, may naturally have a darker skin tone need sunscreen. Now, when you're in water, do you need to adjust how often you sure. apply? Sure, absolutely. I mean, at a minimum, like I said, every two hours. But, um, you know, as you feel it washing off or you're participating in different activities, you're playing volleyball and on the beach and things like yeah. that, you know, you'll, you'll feel it. You'll see it sometimes kind of run off on your skin. Um, so make sure that you're always just kind of aware. And if you feel like your skin is getting hot or starting to burn, um, that's a good opportunity to, hey, I'm going to stop and reapply. Are there some spots that people don't think of or may miss? Uh, a lot of times, yeah, our faces, people think that, you know, or people think that I only need to put it on my face and I don't need it other places. Um, anywhere, you know, like in the folds of your elbows, behind your knees, um, your places ears. like that, your ears, sure, you know, on the back of your neck, a lot of times you see uh, people with red on the back of their neck. Um, and if you're, if you're going to be outside um, and you're wearing a shirt, you know, go under the collar, make sure that you're going under those places that may not seem like they're going to be exposed, but as you move, may be exposed. And you know that once you get a farmer's tan. Absolutely, you, you know, <laughs> you never make that mistake twice, no. right? <laughs> now, there's been some myths about um, sunscreen, sure. one of them being that it actually causes cancer. Yeah, I, I, I mean, th there's really no truth to that. Um, you know, it, it really is the best thing you can protect, uh, use to protect yourself from the sun. There's also this myth that a lot of people say as well, I need to go get a base tan. I have to go to the tanning bed and get my base tan. There's no such thing as a base tan. You know, your skin is either tan or it isn't. Um, you debunked that one for I me. Don't debunk <laughs> that one for you. Is that, you know, you don't need to go to... Um, a tanning bed, you know, before you're going to go to the beach so that you can um, prepare your skin for the color. If you think about it, what a sun tan or what a sunburn really is, is the skin cells on your body are, are dying and they're changing color. And so you don't want to kill off layers of skin and then try to kill off more. <laughs> you want to minimize the amount of damage you're doing to your skin. And these spray oils on that, we really shouldn't be using sure. them. No, those will really just accelerate the effects of the sun. And then, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but I've heard that SPF 50 in 100, because I've seen 100 out there sure. too, that those really aren't any more less well, effective than 15 and 30. So uh, SPF, when we're talking about just UVB radiation and just the, the kind of radiation that causes sunburn and melanoma, just to give you some examples, um, SPF 15 protects against 93%. 
SPF 30 protects against 97%, and SPF 50 protects against 98%. So you're getting incrementally better. Yeah. Um, that's why we say at a minimum 15, um, kind of, you know, if you're someone that has a natural darker skin tone, maybe you may not need a uh, higher SPF, but also just kind of knowing what works for you and just kind of trying different levels out and seeing where you feel most comfortable. And also, depending on how long you're going to be outside, it's one thing to be outside for an hour. It's another thing if you're going to be outside for all day, you may need a, a larger uh, protection for that component time. Definitely. And something that keeps us outside for lengthy periods of time is going to the pool and the beach. Sure. So what are some ways we can protect ourselves and our loved ones sure. when we're out? So when you're heading to the beach, I know we have great beaches here in Cleveland and, and, and people love to make use of them uh, during this time of year. Um, always kind of check the weather before you go. See what, what you're getting yourself into. Um, a lot of the beaches as well, you'll see warning flags and there's a color-coded system and just know what those means. They may not be consistent from beach to beach. They, uh, so know what those mean and if you see what's out there. Um, certainly, if you don't know how to swim, don't go in the water. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not something that um, people can just kind of, oh, I'm just going to try, I'm just going to float. Um, you know, have a little bit of just training. Just dip your toes in. Yeah, yeah, just make sure that, you know, you wouldn't want to, when you think about the risks that you take in other walks of life, you wouldn't do something if you weren't trained in it. Um, if you are going to be swimming, whether it's in a beach or a pool, um, kind of make sure there's others around you. If you're out there by yourself, um, especially at the beach, yeah. um, you know, and know where, if you needed help, that there was someone that could help you, or know that if others were around that needed help, that you could be there to help them. Um, another thing is, um, when you're going in the water, um, you know, it's, we all love to go to the beach and, you know, have a few beers or a glass of wine or something like that, but um, try not to, to be too intoxicated when you're swimming because you can really um, have a loss of your, of your function and your capabilities and um, that can make it harder for you and you may have an accident that you wouldn't otherwise when you were clear of mind. Um, give yourself a break when you're out at the beach too. You know, yes. don't be out there for long periods of time with, hey, I'm going to go inside for 20 minutes or I'm going to go lay under the umbrella. Um, and another thing is to also watch out for your feet. Um, you know, a lot of times at the beach or at pools, um, there's glass, you know, around and there's things like that. Always make sure you're wearing good shoes and, and you don't want to burn your feet as well. Yeah, which can easily happen on sand. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Now you'd mentioned um, being safe in the water and with swimming. I know something, at least being a lakeside, sure. that we find commonly is rip currents. Yeah. How do you get yourself through if you get sucked into a rip current? Well, again, it all goes back to trying not to put yourself in that situation uh, in the first place. Um, and if you are someone who doesn't know how to swim or if you're swimming in an area there isn't a lifeguard, you're just putting yourself at risk. Mm -hmm. So the best prevention you can do is to not put yourself in that situation. Um, if you do find yourself in that situation, you kind of have to make some noise, try to get attention of a lifeguard or somebody, or, or try to make sure that you have a buddy with you there so that you know, the more of you there are, the louder noise you can make. But um, really, you know, if you're in that situation, you have to deal with it, you have to deal with it. But the best uh, advice you can give is to just try not to put yourself in that situation in the beginning. Now, wintertime we think of illnesses, but there yeah. are illnesses that you can get in the summer, especially from water. Yeah. So what are some things that we could sure. possibly deal with during the summer you know, months? A lot of times in the summer months we see at the health department um, when people are in public pools or, or water parks or fountains or things like that, um, a lot of waterborne illnesses, um, a lot of GI bugs, um, something called cryptosporidium, which is uh, a bug that causes a lot of, of uh, gastrointestinal distress and, and you know nausea and vomiting and diarrhea and things like that. Um, if you have uh, an illness like that, don't go in a public waterway. Don't even if it's a lake or, or, or a pond. You know, don't don't uh, take the opportunity to spread that illness. Um, if you are uh, if you have been exposed. Uh, through a, a body of water and you're feeling ill, make sure you go see your doctor and make sure you report that. Um, at the Department of Public Health, we deal a lot with reportable diseases and we only find out about those diseases if people let us know about them. And the w best way to let us know about them is to go see your doctor so your doctor can report that to us. And we will go out and do investigations of if there is, you know, uh, a whole bunch of people that swam in the same pool that got sick, uh, then we can investigate and we can f and find a cause. Um, but we can't do that if we don't know that it's going on. So certainly, um, if you find yourself in that situation, get treated so that it gets on the record. Now, kind of going back to being at the beach, yeah. it's also boating season, a yes. big boating season. So what are some things we can do to protect ourselves when we're out on the waterway? Sure. Um, again, when it comes back to, you know, we all are taught don't drink and drive. Um, but just as important, don't operate a boat um, if you're under the influence of alcohol. Um, it's a heavy piece of machinery and it's, it's sometimes bigger than a car and, and more powerful. And so uh, on a wide open uh, a waterway where there's no roads or no lane markers, you certainly want to be mindful of what you're doing. Um, make sure that you um, have checked your equipment before you head out 
and that if you are operating a boat, that you know that it's been maintained and that everything is up to, to speed, that you don't have any issues with carbon monoxide or anything like that coming oh, yeah. out of the engine. And always make sure that you have life jackets on board. So the law in Ohio is that you have to have uh, one life jacket on board for every adult. Um, and it has, just has to be on the boat, and it has to be a, a Coast Guard approved model of life jacket. Um, and also, any child that's on a boat not only has to have that, li that life jacket, but they have to actually be wearing it the whole time they're on the boat. Uh, and so make sure you're compliant with the law uh, in that regard. Um, and also be mindful of other boaters. You know, the same way that you're mindful of other drivers on the road, you don't know what the person in that other boat is going to do. Um, and, and know what to do if you uh, encounter issues with other boaters. And also, the last thing I would point out is know what to do if someone goes overboard. Yes. You know, making sure that you're able to have a rescue plan or that you're able to know how to notify the Coast Guard and things like that. Yeah, and the being mindful of other boaters is also important, I think, if you're you know, you're out at, in the water just kind of docked and sure. other boats are driving by. If you're jumping into the water to swim sure. and that, other boaters may not see you. Yeah, again, there's no like clear defined uh, lines out there in the mm -hmm. water where people can, uh, can know, hey, I need to stay away from this area or I need to get too close. So just kind of try and keep your distance as best you can if you see other people out on the water. Now with illnesses we were talking about earlier, there, there's also heat related illnesses. Yes. So uh, part of that is what's the difference between heat exhaustion sure. and heat stroke? Sure. So I'm going to tell you five different terms. Um, we'll start with heat rash where you may have small red blisters that are caused all over from the sun. The next most severe level is a sunburn. And we've all had a sunburn. We all know what that's like. It's red and sometimes it's itchy, painful. Um, if it's really severe it may cause blisters. Um, the next more severe thing than that is heat cramps, where you're starting to feel cramping and you're sweating, you'll have spasms and muscle pain. Um, a level more severe than that is heat exhaustion, um, where you may have cold, clammy skin, you may have nausea, you may feel pale, your pulse may be fast, but also kind of weak, um, and you may feel as if you're going to pass out. And then the most severe is heat stroke where if you have a high temperature over 103 degrees Fahrenheit, um, hot, damp skin, your pulse will be racing, and you may actually pass out. Um, which all of those things, uh, no matter how uh, severe they may sound or not severe they may sound, should all be treated with uh, the same level of severity. And you should always, if you're feeling any of those issues, seek the appropriate medical attention, um, whether it's going to your provider or going to an emergency room or an urgent care. Uh, but don't take those things lightly, because they can accelerate from one to the next very quickly. And it, it kind of goes, I mean, for everybody, but if you are working outside, like I'm sure yeah. a lot of contractors and roofers and that have to deal with that sure. risk and elderly people and children. Absolutely. Again, I mean, uh, taking that time to give yourself a break when you're outside for extended periods of time, especially when you're doing severe uh, activity or, or exhausting activity, exerting yourself yeah. um, is always important. And when we're talking about the elderly or children or pets, um, you're going to want to give them a break. You know, don't force them to be outside for long periods of time more than they need to. Now, when it comes to heat, comes to boating, comes to the beach and pools, what are some myths that we can kind of debunk with all of these? Sure. Um, you know, we always talk about, um, you know, it's nice to be outside and it's nice to uh, enjoy the weather uh, and have fun. Um, People tend to drink a lot of alcohol outside in the summertime, um, and, and they also will tend to drink a lot of sugary drinks and, and fruity drinks and things like that. And we always like to say, water first for thirst. So when you're going to be outside for extended periods of time, water, drinking water is the most important thing you can do to kind of regulate your body uh, and, and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Uh, as good as possible. Um, going back as well to, to tanning, you know, people say that, you know, I can't tan if, I, if I'm wearing sunscreen. That's not really true. <laughs> um, you know, or my skin is darker. I don't need sunscreen. You always need to, to do these kinds of things and you always need to um, take those precautions when you're going to be outside. Well, this has been a lot of great info, but I know we have so much more to discuss. Sure. So when we come back to Healthy Cleveland, we'll have more with Shaddy on summer activity preparedness. So stay tuned. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. You're running late, and your path is blocked by water crossing the road. It doesn't look that deep, so you decide to drive through it. Bad decision. And it may be your last.
got a quarter. Welcome back to Healthy Cleveland. I'm your host, Leah Haslidge, and today we're discussing summer activity preparedness. With us is Shadi Swade, who is the project director for the Cleveland Department of Public Health's Office of Emergency Preparedness. And we have Jordan Bryan with the Cleveland Hearing and Speech Center, who is our American Sign Language interpreter. Welcome back. Thank you. Now, mosquitoes and ticks and flies and ants they are such new nuisances in the summer months. Sure. I know they're the bane of my existence. Midges. Oh, yeah. midges. <laughs> yes. So what are some things we can do to prevent them and keep them at bay or completely away? Sure. So some of these things that you talked about, mosquitoes and flies and ticks, they can spread disease. Uh, and so you certainly don't want to take the risk of um, you know, getting bitten by one and, and having West Nile or something like that. Um, you can, re as with anything else, reduce your risk by um, trying not to put yourself in situations where you're going to be bitten by them. If you're going to be outside for extended periods of time, um, use an EPA-approved bug spray um, and make sure that the bug spray that you're using is interfering with your sunscreen. Um, <laughs> if you're going to be outside and it's not too warm out or if you're able to cover your exposed skin, you know, wear a hat, wear glasses, wear long sleeves if you, if you can tolerate it uh, in the weather. Um, if you're going to be sleeping outdoors, I know camping is a very common activity uh, yes. in the summertime. Um, use a tent or use a net. Um, there are different grades of those that can protect you from different kinds of insects. Um, when you're talking about your kids, making sure that you're spraying an approved uh, type of, of uh, bug repellent on your kids. There are different concentrations that are safe for kids to use that may not be the same uh, for adults. Uh, another area that we really worry about is um, for pregnant women or women who may become pregnant. Um, I know Zika has been a hot topic in the yes. news the last few years. Um, especially, um, thankfully, uh, most of the mosquitoes that don't carry Zika, uh, most of the mosquitoes that carry Zika are not found in Northeast Ohio. Um, but if you're traveling, you can also be exposed to those um, if you're going on, down to the south, to other parts of the country or into the Caribbean. Um, and so um, if you are pregnant or if you're planning to become pregnant, um, talk to your physician before uh, uh, this time of year just to, to be safe to, to deal with the threat of Zika. And you mentioned West Nile. That still is an important threat right yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even in this part of the country, we find uh, a couple times a year um, mosquitoes with West Nile. It's, it's rare to have human cases. We'll have maybe one or two a year um, throughout the region, but uh, it's certainly something that you want to be aware of. And what about ticks and fleas? Yeah, I mean, treat them the same uh, as you would with uh, any other insect, you know. Watch your animals. Watch your animals, you know, if you're out in the woods kind of with a buddy, make sure you're checking each other before you go back inside and uh, treat them, you know, uh, with caution as well. Now, something bugs love is food, and yes. this is a big time of year for us to be eating outside and grilling outside. Sure. What are some food safety tips that we need to be aware sure. of? And there's no one who loves grilling outside more than I do, so <laughs> I, I feel really uh, excited to talk about this. But um, it also, you want to take some precautions. Um, when you're handling meat, when you're handling chicken, when you're handling fish, all of these things uh, kind of naturally have bacteria on them. And, and also, uh, so you want to make sure that you are handling them in a safe manner. As you're prepping these foods, you want to uh, make sure that you're being hygienic, that you're cleaning along the way, that you're not cross-contaminating. Um, you know, when I make burgers, I try to, like, use plastic silverware as I'm preparing it so that I can just throw it out and not have to worry about cleaning it. Um, or I try to um, making sure that, you know, I'm washing my hands as much as possible. Constantly. Constantly in between steps, washing your hands, cleaning up as you go, not leaving raw uh, food items sitting around. Um, clean your grill. Um, you know, that's, keep the grill, first of all, away from your house when you use it, but clean it before and after you use it so that you're not cross-contaminating any of the food that way. I think a lot of people think it's kind of like a cast iron skillet where yeah. you can just kind of keep reusing it, but yeah, you can't. And people say, like, you know, it adds flavor to leave those <laughs> on the grill, but I, I, that's not. It adds bacteria and it adds <laughs> yeah, you know, all these bacteria. other sorts of things. And so, um, yeah, making sure that you're, you're keeping your grill clean. Um, if you use a gas grill, um, making sure that you know how to light it. Um, and that you're not opening the gas and leaving it covered so that all that gas can build up. Um, if you use charcoal grill, uh, making sure that you're adding lighter fluid only before you light it and not after it's lit. Um, and things like that that, you know, we all um, love to do those activities and, and we love to um, enjoy that, that in the summertime and enjoy those, those different foods. But there's a safe way to do it and, and a, a way to prevent uh, illness from doing it the right way. 
And there's also like chilling food, and if you yes. have food out, yes. what steps should people be taking? Yeah, like I mean, having sure mom's potato salad, right. can't just leave it wide open Absolutely out. Absolutely, no. Making sure that, um, that food's cool before you put them in the refrigerator, um, because if you put hot foods in the refrigerator, you increase the chance of a foodborne illness. Um, making sure that um, uh, you're not leaving things out. Four hours is kind of generally the rough rule. It's different, more or less, for different kinds of foods, but trying not to leave leftovers out um, for more than four hours. Or in that's direct when, sunlight, probably. Or in direct sunlight, yeah. Another thing that um, I want to mention is when you're actually cooking these foods, um, you know, people love their rare burgers and, and things like that, but you really want to cook things all the way through. The more you leave that pink or the more you leave that, you know, that chicken undercooked or that fish undercooked, the more chance there is that you haven't killed all the bacteria in it. Oh. And that is not good. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> now, what are some safe activities that we can uh, do with our kids and with our pets? Absolutely. So, I mean, certainly we want to enjoy uh, this time of year. We want to be outside. We want the fresh air. We, we spend the winter mostly inside, and so it's Cooped nice up. to get out. Yeah. Um, you know, enjoy the outdoors responsibly. Um, whether you're going to be at the beach, whether you're going to be going for a walk, whatever you're doing, um, just kind of be cautious and be safe. Um, you know, kids love arts and crafts. This is a great time to take them outside to do arts and crafts. Um, what better thing is there to do in the summertime than eat ice cream and popsicles, mm -hmm. you know, especially, and even for your pets, you know, there are uh, out there, there's a lot of um, safe popsicle type products that you can give your dog or, or, or give other animals that uh, are, are fun this time of year. Um, you know, whether you're running through sprinklers, whatever it is you're doing, um, there's lots of, of places in Northeast Ohio um, that have kid-friendly beaches and parks. Um, you know, you may not want to take your kids somewhere where there's rowdy, uh, summertime <laughs> activities going on, but just kind of knowing where these places are and doing your homework a little bit about, you know, before you get there in terms of, can I bring my kid? Can I bring my pet? Is it going to be a safe, fun place? Now, something that a lot of people think are fun are fireworks. Yes. So what's some firework safety tips that we definitely sure. need to be so aware not a lot of? Not a lot of people know that there are very few types of fireworks that are actually legal uh, to use in the state of Ohio. Um, for most of the fireworks that you buy, the big you know, Roman candles and all that kind of stuff, you actually, um, by law, have to take them out of state within 48 hours of buying them, uh -huh. um, which doesn't deter people, I know, yeah. um, but also just, um, you know, know what's legal and know what, um, what you're buying and what you're using and what you should and shouldn't be using. Um, never use fireworks when you're intoxicated. Um, never use fireworks. Um, never let children handle fireworks. Uh, you know, always kind of have adult supervision if you're doing that. And as a good rule of thumb, always keep a bucket of water or a hose or a fire extinguisher or something nearby just in case something takes a turn for the worse. Now, when it comes to bugs and it comes to food safety and it comes to fireworks, what are some other things that you think that we should know about and some myths that probably need to be debunked? Well, I, I mean, again, going back to all the things that, that kind of we talked about, um, uh, summer is a time to uh, enjoy yourself and to be safe. Um, and I guess in terms of myths, it's more about just know what you're getting yourself into and do your homework and um, be prepared. Um, know that if I'm going to be grilling, hey, these are the hazards that I'm encountering. If I'm going to the beach, these are the hazards that I'm going to be dealing with. Um, just think these things through and, and have a plan and um, put some thought into it. Don't just kind of go blindly into a situation. You know, we always say that um, preparedness is the or prevention is the best kind of preparedness. Mm -hmm. So don't put yourself in a, in a bad situation um, without kind of knowing what the risks are first. Is there some kind of overall plan that we should have in place? Yeah, anytime we talk about in preparedness, we talk about ready in three. Uh, and that's a three-step process by which you can prepare yourself and your family. And so there's three parts to that. The first part is to have a kit. Um, you should always have a preparedness kit in your home, or in your car, in your work, um, you know, where you go to school, places like that. Um, and throughout the year, you can cycle what kinds of items are in those kits. Um, so making sure in the summer that you've got uh, flashlights and batteries, but you've got water, you've got non-perishable food items, you've got things that if your power was to be out for a few days at a time, you could, you could survive. Um, and so that's the first part is having that kit. Number two is having a plan. Um, if you are, uh, if you have something happens during the summer, if you have an emergency while you're out at the beach or while you're on the boat and that you need to communicate with your family members, you all kind of agree upon, hey, this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to handle it. Um, if, if we find ourselves in that situation, especially as you talk about, you know, when you're out at the beach or, or yeah. on a boat or places like that. And then the third part is to just be alert um, for more information. You know, things change, information develops quickly when we're talking about in the summer, whether it's weather, whether it's, you know, different uh, types of events going on. So just kind of always be aware of your surroundings and always kind of know what those trusted news sources are where you can get more information. 
And where can we get some more information? So you can uh, check out on the Cleveland Department of Public Health. A lot of this information will be linked to on our website. We're also on, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I would encourage anyone to visit the uh, CDC website at cdc.gov. If you search for any of the topics that we talked about today, there's a lot of great fact sheets and infographics about all that information. Great. Thank you so much, Shetty, for all this thank wonderful information. Me. And thank you, Jordan, for your help today. And thank you for tuning in to Healthy Cleveland. Of course, we'll have more information also for you at tv20cleveland.com. I'm Leah Haslidge. Until next time.